Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where, wherever you are. So welcome to the first INET FB Live event. So I'm Krishna K. Dixit, and I'm here to say a few words about INET and introduce today's speaker. INET Association of English Teachers, INET for short, is a pan-Indian registered association of English language teachers. It's an affiliate of IHFL, International Association of Teachers of English as Foreign Language. INET welcomes and is always ready to work with all stakeholders in English language education. For example, INET works with teachers working in formal and informal sectors with publishers, policymakers, test designers, material writers, and so on. The primary objective of INET is to promote yearly English language education in India by creating better conditions for teachers and students for learning English. INET believes in creating opportunities for teachers to think and learn. So far, INET has organized several conferences. It has published, uh, conducted small-scale workshops, to mention a few. One such opportunity for teachers, for yearly professionals, is INET Connect project. The project is aimed at increasing presence of INET on all social media platforms, thereby increase its reach in the Indian ELE. The INET Connect team at, the, uh, at present, is trying out various activities on social media platforms like Twitter, WhatsApp, Instagram, and INET website. So this present uh, Facebook Live session is one such activity. The team, the project team felt that organizing, uh, organizing learning events like this would forward the goals of INET. So thanks to the team in general and specifically to Venu and Nadim in particular, we are hosting this event, this Facebook Live session by Jason Anderson. So to introduce today's speaker, Jason Anderson is from the University of Warwick in the United Kingdom. Jason is a teacher, teacher educator, researcher, blogger, bird watcher, presenter, materials writer, a consultant among several other roles. Just a uh, visit to his personal website will give a glimpse of his work in English language education and in other areas. So in today's session, Jason is going to talk about presentation practice and production model in English language teaching. So I invite Jason to share his views. So Jason, over to you. Thank you very much, Krishna. Okay, so um, this is a real pleasure, a real honor to be um, speaking on the INET Facebook Live uh, group. Um, it's my first time as well doing Facebook Live, so this will be an interesting technological challenge for me. Um, I can currently see myself at the same time as I'm watching myself and I'm trying to look at the comments. So if I look over there, I've got another screen. That's why I'm looking there. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much to INET for inviting me here. Thank you to Krishna and to Renu and to the whole INET team for suggesting I do this talk and suggesting the topic of PPP, which is something I've been researching. But before I do that, um, let me just ask a few questions. It might be difficult because of a time lag between what I can see on the Facebook page. But here are a few questions. So first of all, uh, I'd like to ask everyone attending, how are you coping with the lockdown situation there in India? Here are a few questions. So first of all, uh, I'd like to ask everyone attending, how are you 
And the second question that I'd like to ask is, how are you communicating with your students at the moment? Are you using Facebook? Are you using Zoom? Are you just uh, giving them something online? What different apps are you using for interacting with your students? Oh, Anil saying the situation is critical in Mumbai. WhatsApp groups as well are very important. Yeah, interesting. Cool. Okay. Well, the same is pretty much happening here in the UK. We're about two and a half weeks into lockdown situation and all of the kids are being taught from home with parents and both teachers working on it. So it's a difficult time for everyone. Uh, I'm quite lucky um, because I don't have any kids around, but uh, uh, just like everyone, I'm suffering from the, the difficulties of isolation. So we're all sharing the same challenge, hopefully this will be a, a little bit of relief for those of you interested in the topic. So the topic that I was asked to talk about is PPP. Um, now PPP, as it's usually referred to, is essentially, if you, if you have to explain in simple terms what it is, um, it's essentially a way of teaching grammar. Um, it can be used for other things, for vocabulary or functional language, but really, in terms of when it came in and what it was most well known for, it was best used for te best well known for teaching grammar. Um, and it includes three stages, and I'm going to be very low tech here, and see if I can show you this. There we go, that's better. Okay, um, and this shows basically what the three stages are with examples. So. Um, in this example, the presentation stage will usually come first and that could be, for example, imagine you're doing on your curriculum, you've got the simple past tense with the students. So you could do a presentation on how to use the simple past tense, such as how to form the regular verb forms with ED ending and also how to do irregular verb forms. Then after that lesson stage, you might do a bit of practice. Uh, where you give the students a fill the blanks activity um, and they have to write the correct verb in the correct past tense and the pronunciation drill activity. Those would be considered two typical practice activities. Um, and then the third phase of PPP, which is kind of the most important one for a number of reasons, is called the production phase. And in that phase, the students would maybe write a story in the past tense, obviously the story would naturally have the past tense in it, or they might talk about what they did on Sunday if you wanted to use speaking skills as the production opportunity. But the basic idea of PPP is that all of these three phases can fit into a lesson, starting with presentation, then practice, then production. And using it specifically in a lesson when your aim is, when your need is, if you like, to teach students on an area of grammar. The example of simple past is a nice easy example to use. If we choose another bit of grammar, uh, one of the, our colleagues I was watching teaching recently in India on Zoom was teaching about gerunds and infinitives. And that's a more challenging bit of grammar to teach using PPP. You might, for example, do a presentation on the difference between infinitive and gerund forms. Then you might give them again, you could use a, a fill the blank activity. But for the production phase, that would be more challenging. You could get students to write, especially now during the lockdown, about what they like doing in their free time. And also to write a little bit about what they would like to do after the lockdown finishes so they could contrast like doing and like to do and that would constitute a fairly controlled production activity but production nonetheless. Um, so those are two examples of what a typical PPP lesson would look like if you were watching it. Um, so 
that's the kind of the first question about PPP. And I notice in the questions that were sent to me, there's been a few questions also on my uh, blog post. Uh, Rao asked the question, how does it work in a present day context? And that might be an example um, PPP lesson structure. If you want to look at more examples, the paper I wrote for Elta Journal, if you scroll down, the one that's called Why Practice Makes Perfect Sense, in that one there's a, another example of a lesson structure. So the next question I want to answer is, where does PP come from? Well, it comes from the UK. It's essentially evolved out of the approaches to teaching that were happening back in the 1970s. Um, during the 1990s, there was a fiction created that PPP came from before communicative language teaching, when in fact PPP actually evolved during the early formative period of communicative language teaching. The person who introduced it wrote this book, and in this book it appears for the first time. The book is called Teaching Oral English by Don Byrne. And I'm sure you can't see it, but I'll show you the page where it's first described. It's just down here. Um, and uh, in, this, in this book, Don Byrne basically takes the idea of PPP from an earlier book by Julian Dakin who also had a similar model, but didn't become so famous. And Julian Dakin was working with one of the most important early researchers in communicative language teaching, Stephen Pitt Corder, in Scotland in the 1960s. And this was the time when, when Dakin came up with the model that became PPP. So it's, it's a, an early communicative model, and many people today would consider it to be a weak communicative model. In other words, there are much stronger models for communicative language teaching, especially task-based language teaching is the, the kind of the dominant one now from the stronger group of models. Um, before PPP, what was happening in the UK, not always, but generally, if we kind of can generalize about it, was that there was a lot of teaching of maybe presentations and there was a, a lot of practice in terms of especially pronunciation drills but there wasn't necessarily a great deal of um, opportunities for students to use the language. In the 1960s there was a fairly common belief that giving students too much freedom could lead to too many errors and those errors could then cause the students to fossilize and to, 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 to make those errors continuously. Um, during the research that happened in the late 1960s with Corda and other people, one of the arguments that was put forward that you hear the originator of PPP making himself, Don Byrne, is that in fact those opportunities to communicate, to make mistakes, are very important. They're a natural part of the learning process. And hence that production opportunity was included into the model by Don Byrne when he uh, wrote it for the first time. It then gained popularity and there was a question about this, a very interesting question from one of you. It gained popularity in some contexts, perhaps the, the context that solidified it as a dominant approach of the 1980s was the Cambridge CELTA course and the similar courses such as the Trinity Cert TESOL, which were courses which pe people were taking in the UK back then to become language teachers. Um, so um, in the Cambridge CELTA, today it's a lot different to that I think, but back then PPP became the dominant paradigm, the dominant way to structure a grammar lesson that teachers were expected to show, do a good presentation, then to do some pronunciation drilling, some control practice and then some freer practice towards the end of the lesson. Um, that was one of the contexts in which it evolved. Um, so one of you who asked the question about what PPP is today mentions how the RSA trains new teachers. Well, the RSA doesn't, doesn't run the CELTA anymore, but essentially that is part of the answer. And it has become the weak form of communicative language teaching, which is one of your other questions. Um, it's also been adopted in school education systems um, in a number of parts of the world. You can see it quite common in some, in some countries in, in Europe, uh, in Eastern and Southern Europe. You'll see where there's quite a strong grammar syllabus. You'll see teachers often doing lessons with the presentation, practice, production phases, and also in parts of Southeast Asia. It can be quite common. But equally, you see in fact, probably more in many parts of the world, you see a lot of teachers doing the kind of the presentation phase and the practice phase 
but without the production phase. So you tend to get presentation practice lessons rather than presentation practice productions lessons. Um, so the next question that might be useful to discuss for a moment is the question about, does it work? Is PPP a good way to teach? Well, this is where PPP faces a lot of controversy. Um, there's a, a large body of research within the so-called second language acquisition research, which is the research which informs language teaching. Um, and that body of research done mainly on the cognitive processes of how we learn, tells us something very important, that the way that we learn grammar doesn't necessarily follow the way that it's taught. That each learner seems to have a natural, almost innate order in which they will learn grammar, irrespective of how we teach it. And that's an important point because one of you asked a question, this was a really interesting question, you said that it's observed that students cannot master a structure in a given time or they fail to use it in day-to-day -day life and how to cope with that. Well, that's entirely natural that what's happening there is the students aren't ready for that structure at this point in their learning process. Teaching it doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily a bad thing because it raises their awareness of it, but it may be a long time before they start to adopt that into their... Um, own language use. Um, so it was a really interesting question and that question is kind of answered by that body of SLA research that tells us something very important that when it comes to grammar students seem to learn it in a predictable order that we as teachers can't necessarily control. So whilst it is useful to provide instruction in grammar it is probably more useful to provide the opportunities to use the language meaningfully and that will enable that natural learning process to happen as it always does. Um, now, PPP itself follows a kind of a different theory of learning, one which we call skill acquisition theory. The idea behind it is that if we practice something enough, we will acquire it, we will learn to use it more effectively. We know that that's true when it comes to, for example, musical instruments, or when it comes to learning to drive a car practice makes perfect. But the key question with language teaching is whether this actually helps with, for example, grammar. We know that it helps with Lexis, with learning vocabulary. Students can learn it in the order that we teach it as long as they work hard and they memorize the Lexis. With grammar, as I said, there's much more controversy about this. In terms of exam performance, I know many teachers in India are expected to prepare students to answer exam questions that ask them about specific areas of grammar. When it comes to that, then the answer is yes. By providing those presentations, you will enable the students often to answer those exam questions, especially if you include practice and production afterwards, that will also lead to more natural learning. Um, but when it comes to that innate process of learning, you may find that there are big differences between what you're teaching and what students are often producing when you get them to use the language in the classroom. But the, the key con point to make in all of these is that there is a difference between the explicit knowledge that PPP can help your learners to gain. And the explicit knowledge is, for example, their ability to answer the question, what is the past simple form of this verb? Um, or what is the uh, correct verb to fill this gap in a sentence? With that kind of language use, then a PPP approach can help. And in that sense, it can help to improve their exam results. What it won't necessarily do is lead to more natural learning, more natural acquisition, as one would do, for example, if one moved into a community where, where a language is spoken that you wanted to learn and they learnt it naturally. Uh, I see a question there from Mina Kumari about acquiring the speaking skill. Um, and and to, uh, I'll come on to that in a moment, but essentially when it comes to acquiring the speaking skill, the phase of PPP that is by far most important is this production phase down here. Practice will help with that. So um, the next question I wanted to discuss was one of the ones that you, you submitted. How might awareness of PPP help in the Indian context? 
and is it practiced? Well, I've been doing a lot of research in India over the last uh, year or so, in mainly in Maharashtra, Telangana, and West Bengal. Um, and one thing that I've noticed is that PPP isn't very common in the Indian context, because in India, English is taught as much as a subject as it is as a language skill. There is a strong focus in India on English literature. Excuse me, that includes teaching poetry, teaching about uh, certain works, short stories, for example, in which students are expected to learn about the poetry, things like what are called figures of speech, uh, metaphor, alliteration, all of these devices of, of literature. And they're also expected to learn about the content of the texts for the scene texts that are often used in the exam. Um, in that part of learning, what you're dealing with in India is much more declarative knowledge, a bit like when you're teaching a different subject, such as social studies or science, learners need to reproduce the knowledge that is in the curriculum in order to do well in the exam. And in that area, because skill uh, PPP is a skills-based theory of learning, it won't necessarily be of much use, but it will be of use when it comes to other parts of learning. So for example, for the CCE, the Compre uh, Comprehensive Continuous Evaluation that's present in, I think, pretty much all education systems in India, different ways are used of assessing that in different states in India. In Telangana, for example, the discourses is uh, what they call discourses are used and students are expected to write uh, stories or to write conversations or speeches or reports. And for those kind of texts, which are much more holistic, then an approach to learning language, which is skills based, is likely to help more. And that's likely to give the learners the ability to use the language to, to complete those kind of texts. Um, so, yeah, if you if if you want your students to to use language more in the classroom, then the part of the PPP focus that you need to kind of focus on more is this third phase, the production phase. One thing that I've seen quite a lot of in India as well is that teachers do a lot of presentation. Some teachers do quite a lot of practice, but when it comes to the production, that often doesn't happen in the classroom. Students may be told to do something for homework or it may be omitted altogether. And that's the part of the lesson where most writers on the theory of language learning would argue the learners are learning most naturally and potentially most usefully. So yeah, um, that's an important point I think to make. Um, plus I also think we need to talk about in the Indian context, the challenges of using an approach such as PPP. In India, there's a range of different class sizes. I've noticed that often in urban contexts, classes get larger, but in many rural contexts, not all, classes can be quite small. I've seen classes in India from as little as uh, nine or 10 learners to well over 60 or 70 learners. If you've got a large class, when it comes to the production phase of the lesson, trying to do a speaking activity and expecting them all to use English is going to be a real challenge. In those kind of classes, you might get more production by getting learners to work in pairs, to write some kind of written text using the language. So if you remember the example I provided, at this final third phase, you could get your learners to write a story working in pairs or even individually if you want to see what they're, how they're all progressing with their use of that particular bit of grammar. Um, in a smaller class, you could put them into small groups or pairs to talk, for example, if again you're teaching the past simple, to talk about what they did on Sunday, what they did at the weekend, um, or maybe to remember the last time they left their village, where they went, who they visited, and so on. And that will provide them with an opportunity to use the language. And it's that kind of speaking skill that will help learners to improve their proficiency in English. But again, in those situations, what will be quite natural for many learners is to use the mother tongue, to use the vernacular, or to use a range of languages if you have them in the class. And as a teacher, that you should recognize that that's a completely normal way for the learners to communicate. If you find it's happening a lot, then focus on maybe not getting them to use English in the conversation, but to get them to produce something in English. So again, they could talk about what they did uh, over the weekend, 
in the conversation and they could use the mother tongue to do that and then together they could write a summary text with one or two sentences about each member of the group and then that would lead them from using the mother tongue to describe the activity in question to using English and that's an opportunity both to include the mother tongue. Harish um, asked me one question about multilingual learners on the website and that I thought was a really important one about multilingual learning that that would enable a more multilingual approach because PPP was not developed for multilingual learning. It was very much developed at a time when there was a dominant belief that the best way to teach English was through English only. And that's not what we believe now. And on a personal level, I, pers I, I have a lot of strong beliefs that the mother tongue is an extremely important part of learning, especially for younger learners, and especially in difficult contexts for learning a foreign language, such as in uh, many parts of India. So yes, Harish, to answer your question, you can use uh, PPP multilingually in a range of different contexts, in a range of different ways. Now I'm just looking at the time, I'll finish this and we'll introduce uh, back Krishna in a moment, I think. There was another question actually about the fact that the PPP is deductive, not constructivist. Um, that what I thought was a really important point. You're right, yes, PPP is kind of mandated with a, the teacher presents something initially, at the start of the lesson and that's quite a teacher-centered approach. Um, a constructivist approach could replace the presentation with a discovery activity in which learners notice the new language in the text and then try to work out what the key features of it are. For example, by underlining examples of past simple verbs in a text and noticing that they've all got the same ending, at least that would be true for regular verbs. Um, but it's important to say that while a discovery approach often is more student-centered, there is some important evidence that more deductive approaches reduce what we call the cognitive load on the learner, that when they're sitting observing a presentation, because they're not being required to solve a problem, they can focus much more on understanding the content of that presentation. And there's some very important research going on in Australia by writers such as Kirshner and Sweller, who are actually arguing that these deductive approaches can actually lead to more learning when it comes to the declarative type knowledge that PPP is focused on providing for your students. So it's an interesting question about that. Yes, it is deductive, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing or that it doesn't lead to, to learning of the right type. Um, there's also another important part, question that somebody asks. During the production phase, they say students may may divert or diverge from the target language that you introduced. And in that situation, I would say, don't worry, that's a very natural part of the students using language meaningfully. In fact, I would honestly say, if you find that you're introducing a piece of language and then using a production activity and the students are, are focusing much more on meaningful communication than on using the target language, I personally would say that's a very good thing, that it's the communication itself that probably leads to more learning than the use of the structure that you introduced. So in that situation, listen to what they're doing, listen to the um, conversations they're having and provide feedback on what they're trying to say and how they could say it better in the production phase. Um, yeah. So there we go. Those, I think, are all of the questions that you've asked about PPP thus far. Um, let's see if we can bring Krishna back into the conversation. I don't know if Krishna is there um, or one of the other guys who I think were going to join me for this chat. And we can see if we can um, talk about it a bit more. Oh, I, just an interesting question from Anil Dalal there. Very good question, Anil. Um, only teachers are expected to present or students can present. I think, Anil, what you're doing there is more advanced than PPP because clearly I think in your lesson you're getting students to present, which is a, a really interesting idea. Sometimes students can do better presentations than we can do as teachers because they focus on the bits of the language that they find useful. And so that's a really interesting idea that in PPP, the assumption was that only the teacher could present. But the fact that you're suggesting that students can present indicates that you've kind of moved to a different stage of teaching than PPP and are facilitating a much more autonomous approach to learning. 
which I think is a really interesting idea. Well done. Um, so yeah, let's just double check with time. It's 5.30. So um, Krishna, if you can come back into the conversation, that would be great. While you're doing that, um, I'll just have a look at some of the comments. Ah, very good question there from someone. Why PPP of less use with very young learners? This is a really, really important question. Thank you. We know that when you get to about your teenage years, you can understand a theoretical presentation on a bit of grammar. For example, you're trying to explain to students why we sometimes use an infinitive form, I want to go, and sometimes we use a gerund form, I enjoy going. Young, Very young learners, that information, they may sit there and listen and nod, but it's very difficult for them to make use of that because of the the developmental stage they're at. And with very young learners, the research is very clear that um, they don't necessarily learn the language that we're presenting. They learn through listening to language, through, if they can, through starting to read and through trying to communicate with language. So if you're working with very young learners, especially at pre-primary level and the first two or three years of primary school, those explicit presentations where you try to explain grammar to them probably will have very little impact. And what works much more effectively are games, role play activities, poems, stories and rhymes. And all of these will improve their ability to learn language more easily. Um, and there's an interesting question again uh, from, oh, they're zooming along. Is it important to use PPP model in planning a lesson? It depends. As I said earlier, the, most of the curricula in India don't just focus on grammar. There is a very strong literature focus. If the aim of a specific lesson that you're teaching is to introduce a bit of grammar to the learners, then a PPP model can provide you with a useful lesson structure. But while we're waiting, uh, Krishna, I don't know if Krishna is coming back in to the conversation, or maybe Renu can join me. Um, if she's there. Um, anyway, um, let me show you a different approach to teaching, which some of you may be making use of. I've talked a lot about PPP. Here's another approach. Task-based learning, to very, very simplify it, this of course is not what many of the writers of task-based learning would call it. Task-based learning would believe that it's the production phase that is the most important one and that you need to start your teaching here. So you start with an activity that gets them to use the language. So let's go back to the example of present simple. Rather than introducing present simple at the start of the lesson, you simply get the students to write a story and see how they write their story. And then you provide any input on language and opportunities to practice if they have difficulties with it. Um, and to give another example of how uh, Deepika is asking also about the, the qu planning question. Um, to give another example of, of how you might use a more task-based learning, one lesson I saw recently that used a very interesting task-based learning involved, in fact, it was a project, involved the students doing interviews with somebody. Um, and the teacher got them to begin with the interviews in English and then found that they had some problems with, with using questions. And so as a result of that, the teacher then went back and in a later lesson gave them a little bit of a presentation and controlled practice on how to ask questions. So that would be an example of a more task-based lesson. And many of you will find, especially at younger learner levels, that a task-based approach will work well. Okay, here's Krishna back. Hi, Krishna. Hi. So that was really, really interesting, Jason. Uh, as I was yeah. So as I was listening to you, I was recalling my days in the college where I worked for 20 years. So there, was, there were eight classes uh, of English language. They, were, they used to be conducted concurrently. And in all those classes, what I, what I witnessed was this PPP was something like taken for granted, though it wasn't labeled as PPP, and it uh -huh. wasn't there in the in, it it wasn't there uh, in the in the scheme of thinking of those teachers, but it was there. So what happened every time was teacher somehow presented either explicitly, sometimes, and sometimes through some activities something was presented, 
So that's how all English uh, lessons began. And, and was this at was this at for secondary teachers or for tertiary level teachers? This was for college. This, this was for secondary uh, level. Mm. And uh, second phase was students were given some activities, and of course, as you rightly said, that curriculum was um, I mean based on literature, and it was assumed that there were some some tasks. So they were given as homework, and it was just assumed by teachers that that is production. So yeah. someone yeah. felt that okay, this this model uh, is in operation. Is there? Mm. Keep going. Yeah, I'm listening. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I I was wondering if we make teachers aware that okay, this is how this PPP things work. So is, is that going to influence their practice? In any different way, I I think you have way more experience of this. What's your feeling? I want I want to hear your opinion. Also, I, I'm just interested before you answer that, if you may, because Krishna, you have a huge amount of experience of working in different contexts in India. What's your feeling about whether explaining that will influence them either positively or negatively? And would you agree with my interpretation of what's currently happening in India? Can I ask you? So uh, I'm I'm not uh, aware of what's happening at the primary level because I'm aware from those classes. Uh, when I was here in Vardha, so I used to have some information. Uh, or, uh, I used to get some information what's happening in those classes. But now, after relocating myself to Delhi, so I'm aware. But I. Uh, but especially as far as uh, I can guess, and I keep talking to teachers, especially secondary and tertiary level teachers. So they, I believe that they still follow this this type of, let us say, model in guiding their le in as a guiding principle for their lessons, for mm -hmm. transacting the curriculum is what I think. And uh, to answer your second question. If teachers are made aware of this model, when you were speaking, I was looking at all the comments. So some comments were like, "Is uh, I read those comments like, is it something new, something latest? So uh, if it is presented as something latest, and I think that, okay, so this will give some direction to uh, this language teaching and learning. Well, as as we discussed, it's nearly as old as as me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's nineteen seventy six PPP was uh, yeah. was first discussed, and and Dakin's model is is earlier. So it's definitely not new, and it is kind of a common sense model. It's a common sense approach, which is why we often see it in different contexts around the world, even if teachers haven't been taught to use it. And but the the, the question that I'm interested in. A reflection of an Indian teacher such as yourself, Krishna, or a teacher educator, is do you think most teachers are doing PPP? Do you think they're doing PP or do you think they're just doing the presentation part of it? Um, in majority of the cases, I would say presentation part. And it is, mm. and teachers just assume that uh, the second P and third P will eventually happen. Mm. So it's just an assumption. Yeah, so, and, but and it's sure, interesting that, I'm sure that a lot that, of Indian teachers, mm -hmm. sorry, you know, let me just say this point. It's interesting that a lot of Indian teachers often express concern that their students are not speaking English, mm -hmm. but they don't provide that opportunity because when it comes to this idea of, well, giving them, getting them speaking English, if you're only doing the presentation part of it or the presentation and the practice, there is no opportunity for them to speak English in this production part. And so I think that would be kind of the first piece of advice. But we could also take the task-based model, which is where you start with the production, and then if necessary, you can move back to the presentation and the practice as well, which is an alternative way. And I've seen, I've seen both of these working well in Indian classrooms, in the classes of experienced, more expert teachers in India. Um, and that's why I think it's, it's a good thing for Indian teachers not to accept either of these models as right or wrong, but to accept them as possible ways of designing lessons. A number of our colleagues are asking, 
is this the best way to to plan lessons and the answer is firstly there is no best way and secondly um all of these different ways of teaching have often have a theory behind them a theory of learning and depending on what you're preparing your students for a different theory may work well so if you're preparing your students for an exam with a lot of questions about grammar a lot of fill the gap activities then in those situations fill the blank activities then a PPP approach might work really well. If you work in an educational system in India, for example, in private school education, where students are expected to take a more skills-based exam where they have to do a speaking activity and a writing activity, then in those situations, you might find, in fact, that a task-based approach is likely to lead to the students being able to communicate more effectively, as happened, of course, in Prabhu's task-based language teaching project, the Bangalore project, which also happened way back in the 1970s when we were just little kids, Krishna. <laughs> What's yeah. your feeling about comparing those two? I, I, I agree. I, I agree what you're saying. Uh, but uh, just one point I would like to make, that this production thing gets a little ignored. Uh, I think that can be attributed to this assessment or examination system in India. Because uh, teachers always focus on this examination. And they... Go on, go on, go on. It's really interesting. They focus on the exams and... So, so what I was trying to say was, uh, and this PPP model has adapted itself to this uh, this prescribed given curriculum, this, uh, this these exams, and, and the way the schools are administered and ran. So and under the pressure of these three things, I think the administration, the assessment, and the prescribed curriculum, so uh, it has been reduced to only first first P and in some cases two P's, first and second. That's so right. third, one yeah. is, third one is completely left out. And I see what you're saying. It's because this third P is the beginning point in task-based learning in that model. Okay. Mm. So, but this third phase gets always ignored because that doesn't, that doesn't carry uh, any significance in this certification process, especially in our context. Right. And, and it's important, Krishna, I think that we mentioned the fact that to people watching and asking questions, what do I do? In India, there are so many different contexts. Some teachers are judged on their ability to get their students through the exam, through the grade 10 exam and through the grade 12 exam. And for those teachers, especially because they're learners, more than anything else, need their teacher to help them to continue their education. The piece of advice that I personally would say is, make sure that you do help them with that exam. But the key question is whether you take a direct route or an indirect route. And I've seen teachers doing both of these effectively. The direct route is where you teach to the test. So you enable the students to answer the kind of questions that will come up in the exam. That's kind of the fastest way to give your learners the ability to pass that exam. The indirect way, which I've also seen done effectively, is that you develop their you attempt to develop their proficiency in English using things like a more task-based model, a more practice-oriented model, so that they can, um, so that they develop the proficiency independently, which will enable them then to answer the exam questions. So in that second example, for grades seven, eight, and nine, you might give students much more practice in skills, much more of the production part of the PPP model. And then when you come to grade 10, you may need to then focus more on the exam content to get them through the, the grade 10 exam. But to make that point, I think is really important that each teacher in an Indian uh, school context <clears throat> has to pay attention to A, what the learners and their parents need out of their English lessons and B, what they're being assessed for as well. Hey, Eddie. Hey. Hi. So I think, I think you've got, you've got your, your um, microphone, microphone on speaker. speaker. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I can I hear, can hear an, echo. an echo. Okay. Am I audible now? Uh, uh, yes. Yes. That's, that's, 
I'm still, I'm hearing, still it. hearing it. Can you can hear, you can hear anyone, anyone else hear an echo? Yes, I will use it again. How about now? Just try turning the speaker off. Yeah. That's better. That's great. Yeah, good. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, Nadim, welcome. Thank you as Thank well you. for coming along. What did you think about um, the issues that Krishna and I were discussing? Yeah, those issues are very relevant. Thank you for taking up this call and uh, speaking about the PPP paradigm in uh, language education. Uh, Jason, sir, you have traveled across India. You have traveled to many states in India. And I would uh, ask uh, what states, not states, rather I would, uh, I would say uh, what are the boards, which are the educational boards and which course books have these PPP model in their curriculum? Mm. It's a really, really interesting question. I think that in India, you kind of have within different states and different educational systems, a kind of a, a, a line between curricula which are oriented much more towards literature teaching and in those curricula there is much more of a focus on specific pieces of poetry specific plays and stories and in the exam students are tested on the content of them and this is what we can call teaching english as subject in india um, and then you have at the other end of the curriculum kind of more skills oriented curricula now if you were to kind of relate them to the west you might find that a cbse curriculum or a cbse textbook for secondary level has more of the skills oriented approach that in the textbook students will be asked to do a little bit more of the speaking activities to use a little bit of grammar sorry i got a, I had a call coming in there from someone in india ironically um so um yeah they will be the students will will often have a more if you like cbse is i suppose a bit more a bit more skills oriented so you can sometimes see ppp lessons within the cbse curriculum and cbse because it's kind of a, a, quite a prestigious educational board often used by private schools is seen to be more progressive whereas a lot of the state mandated um curricula and textbooks such as in maharashtra where you are you will see a much more literature-oriented focus. And so in grade 11, which I think you teach, there's yeah. the Shakespeare play. Um, yeah, which it's one a night's nice um, dream. It's a night's dream, which is really, really challenging for the learners. Interesting, um, lots to learn from it, but really challenging and with very little kind of um, skills-oriented practice in that. Whereas also in, in, in Maharashtra State, you've got other kind of practical activities in the textbooks. Um, I can't remember in which grade it is where students have to bring in an item of packaging and yeah. talk about it in the class. And it's that's in the ninth standard. The that's ninth right. standard that's live more English. Task-based task -based kind of approach yeah. where students are actually using English or, or you know, maybe not just using English, but where they're talking about something more meaningful within English as well. And so you, you get a wide variety in every curriculum system. But if you had to plot them on a line, you've got those which are a bit more skills oriented to those which are a bit more literature oriented. And I think PPP is more relevant in the skill side of things. When you're teaching English as subject, English literature, then in fact, what you're essentially teaching is a subject that is much more in common with teaching social science, with teaching um, uh, maths or you know geography, history, where the learners have to learn declarative knowledge that they then reproduce in the exam. Yeah, What's thank your you for feeling that. about that? Yeah, uh, one more thing. Uh, I have read many comments over here in the live session and uh, many questions uh, are there regarding is PPP only for productive skills like speaking and uh, writing and for teaching grammar, functional grammar only? Or uh, does it cater to all the skills of language teaching? It's a really good question. Um, my, To be honest, my honest feeling is no, it doesn't cater for all. And this is one of its massive flaws. There was a really important book written in the 1990s in the West. This book here, I'll see if I can bring it closer, called Challenge and Change in Language Teaching, edited by Jane and Dave Willis. And the whole book is essentially criticism of PPP um, from different approaches. Michael Lewis is arguing for the lexical approach. Jane and Dave Willis are arguing for task-based learning. And other people are arguing for different models. And 
in that, one of the things, the points that's being made is that it doesn't really work with Lexis and that it doesn't work as well when it comes to skills. And when we come back to do a discussion about skills later on, I'll talk about the model that I've mentioned that is much more in line with what happens in Indian textbooks, where there is a more a stronger focus on reading, which is the central skill, I think, within Indian uh, textbooks and curricula. We've just been joined by Renu, I think. Hi, Renu. Hi. Hi, sir. Welcome. Uh, uh, yeah, we came to know that BPP is quite flexible in its approach and the teachers from Maharashtra or even teachers from India can use it interchangingly depending on the, uh, the skill she wants to present in the, um, for the students. Uh, she wants to, uh, what her objectives are, basically what her objectives are and how she can bring about uh, BP, only BP and then uh, the P part, the, the last P part, the production part. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it was a very good discussion and uh, you have highlighted a lot of uh, points from the Indian context, uh, how it can be adopted and adapted uh, to all the teachers. They, they are focusing only on, on the first two PPs and uh, the last piece uh, not taken care of. But uh, uh, I feel uh, uh, there are a lot of questions regarding this PP. There, uh, one question has come from Rohini Sankpal Kolapur. Can the teacher break its PPP means only PP, that is presentation and practice, as per the requirement of her students? Yeah, I mean, they can. Um, and that will help them when it comes to, for example, exam performance, because there's a lot of the kind of practice activities in the exams. But if you want to facilitate the more natural learning processes, then it's the opportunity to communicate meaningfully that will help the learners to do that. If you're teaching a small class of mature students who can do a speaking activity seriously and use some English in it, then speaking is possible. But also writing is a very important part that I think always needs to be emphasized in the Indian context. Even in a very large class, um, it's possible to get them all to do that. And that writing will have an indirect approach, influence on their ability to do to do uh, better. So for example, in an exam, that writing ability will come through. Um, in, For example, in Maharashtra, when you have the CCE, you may have some activities that you give them that assess these skills and assess their ability to write effectively in English. Uh, so is it basically focusing on the speaking and writing skills? Yeah. Okay. It uh, is. Yeah. It is basically uh, those production skills are focused on. And uh, therefore, large classes will be a big problem. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the, uh, the second question is from Pradeep Diore Nase. Uh, he said, my experience is that students can easily get grammatical concept, practice and produce too. But they get problem uh, to align it with regular use in language. How can we inculcate it? Mm. Well, you can't inculcate it. Um, it has to come from within the learner themselves. The, the, um, it's a very perceptive point by Pradeep that, that you know, learners can often do it in the lesson in question. And that what will often happen is there will be errors, there will be mistakes. We can provide feedback. And the trick here is not to provide too much direct correction, especially at secondary level, when students are in front of their peers, their classmates. If you correct an individual learner, they will often that will often have a negative effect on their ability to use the language in the future. They may be too shy or they may be scared of making another mistake. What's a really good idea is to facilitate that speaking, because remember, the errors themselves don't necessarily hinder the learning, um, but that you notice which errors are more common and you provide more general feedback at the end of the activity or even next lesson to help them with the errors that you spotted, that you noticed. You can even use those errors to plan for a future lesson, but it's entirely normal that you, learners will make those mistakes. And the research indicates that they are a natural part of the learning process. Learners' errors probably become corrected by the learners being exposed to appropriate language use. So for example, if they're listening to you as a teacher, Renu, 
and mm. they're hearing how you use English, that will be a much stronger influence on their correctness, whatever we mean by that, than direct correction of their errors, which time and time again, the research has indicated, yes, there is an impact from direct correction of errors, but it's actually not that strong. And learners probably learn much more from being exposed to texts. And it's really interesting that one of the key problems with PPP has been very clearly um, noticed by many of the people in the chat that um, there is no input of language, of, of text, if you like, in PPP. There's no reading skills. There's no listening skills necessarily in, uh, suggested by it. It's all to do with productive skills, which is a reflection of the time in the 1970s when people wanted to use language specifically for often for visiting countries where native speakers are present and for speaking, producing language in relation to them. And that isn't necessarily the concern of many Indian learners or indeed curricula where they're focusing much more on written language use and on understanding texts as the reading skill. Well, um, yeah, uh, so what I was saying is, um, is the PPP uh, suggesting that error should not be corrected directly? Well, that's a yeah. really interesting question. If you go back to Byrne, he makes a really yeah, memorable I, quote yeah. in this book, the guy who comes yeah. up with it, which, which he says that he, he balances. He balances between the point of, yes, correction is important, but far more important is the opportunity to use the language. And those are words of wisdom that I think haven't changed much, despite about five decades now of SLA research, one of the things that we know is that it's, it is often the meaningful language use that helps the natural learning process of learning a language. And error correction can help feedback is necessary in all types of learning but exposure giving them opportunities to see examples of of appropriate english of good english will also be an important influence so on and off uh, implicit ex explicit uh, balance okay yeah, uh, we have a third balanced. question third yeah. question from pradeep devra uh, sorry third question from sachin Mate, mumbai He's saying, uh, can it be, can it motivate uh, the students for such presentation, the PPP model? Good question. There was a question, I don't know if it was the same person who, who mentioned the point about presentation. Um, when students do presentations in teaching, it often happens after, for example, if we're doing projects, production, a student production, presentation yeah. can happen at the end of the project work. That's kind of a different model of learning altogether. Project-based learning wasn't very big back then. And on a personal level, I'm a bigger fan of project-based learning than I am of PPP, despite the fact that I did much more research into PPP. So the answer is yes, students can and do do um, do presentations and knowing how good Indian learners are at presentations an alternative completely different way of doing PPP is to give different groups of learners in your class a task that they have to study one bit of grammar or one bit of language that will be useful for whatever reason for example it might be how to write an essay or how to write a report then they can do a presentation on it before learners then do practice and then try themselves to do it so that you get different groups of learners leading lessons which are ppp oriented which is something i've also seen happening in other challenging contexts i think in Palestine, there was one of my colleagues mentioned that it's possible to do something like that in those kind of contexts, starting with learner presentations, then practice, and then learner production. So uh, this basically is, uh, when we say students presentation, is basically focusing on the last piece, the production part. And again, it is taking the learners, learners autonomy approach when you're saying the students are presenting yeah. it. Exactly. And we may be confusing people here by talking yeah. about the production also being a presentation. But yes, so so because the PPP approach is essentially quite teacher centered, it starts with a teacher presentation, then teacher leading practice and only then giving learners a production right. opportunity. If you're in a context where you can hand over more agency, more control to the learners, then that will then that will probably in itself give more opportunities again for meaningful language use 
for learners to interact with their language, and then for you to also give feedback uh, to them after their presentations. And then we're talking about an a completely different model altogether. You might have something like presentation, practice, production, presentation, and then more kind of uh, whatever, more practice. Krishna is back with us. Hey, yeah. welcome back, Krishna. So thank you. Thank you, Jason. Okay, thank, thank, you, you, thank you, Jason and Dino. So there's a request to all our viewers so here. So we are sharing the feedback link. So there's a request for all our viewers to give feedback on this session. Right. Just looking at some of the comments. Again, oh, Krishna. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really yeah. interesting points. One other thing, I don't know if it's yeah. possible just to mention, people talk a lot about in India about deductive versus inductive approaches. And PPP falls into the category very much of deductive approaches. I've got that the right way around, haven't I? That the teacher starts off with a presentation. And many of the, the Indian teachers learn about the importance of inductive learning, of learners finding the rules themselves. And PPP itself was introduced at a time when that wasn't a focus. And it doesn't mean that using those inductive approaches isn't a good idea because it is a good idea. By getting learners to find the rules themselves, you're often getting them accelerating the learning process. Yes. As I think it's the time to time to close this discussion. So, Jason, thank you so much for such an interesting presentation on PPP. I'm sure that all our viewers and our teachers uh, got few moments to think on this issue, and I'm sure that this is going to help them in their practice. And uh, thank you, Jason, for your continuous support to INIT activities. So thanks to okay. Nadeem, uh, Satish Thakre, and uh, Renu Dhotre. So it's just because of them, their hard work, this event has been possible. So special thanks to Satish Thakre for hosting and managing this live session very well. So thanks to all our viewers for their active part for your active participation and your comments and questions. So finally, so keep watching INET FP page for our further activities. Uh, right. So thank you so much for the time. So have thank a nice you day. as well for everyone for coming. Thank you as well, Krishna.